Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to you. Just a couple of announcements as we begin. First of all, a reminder that our Holy Bible Club is getting closer. Uh, so do keep spreading the word and praying for that. Um, Middle Church this evening, our epilogue service is 7 p.m. Um, short service, 7 p.m. Don't be afraid to come. Be good to see you back. Um, Middle Church tonight. And then a reminder also of our craft fair on Saturday the 28th of September. Uh, there's lots of things that need done prior to it and during it. So if you're able to help, please do uh, come forward and let us know and also uh, spread the word again. Okay. Let's stand to sing our opening hymn for this morning. Um, number 376. We don't have any screens today. So 376 in the hymnal. Uh, Ye holy angels bright. Let's stand to sing. turn on your prayer book to the Holy Communion service on page 180. Uh, let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. for today, the 10th Sunday after Trinity. 
Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our epistle for this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning at verse 1. Uh, you'll find that on page 1175 in the Pew Bible, page 1175. Ephesians 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave them give gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the, one, is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and others to be pastors and teachers. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, he will no longer be, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every kind of wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful schemes. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Here ends our epistle. If you turn to page 971, you'll find our gospel reading. Please stand. The Holy Gospel is written in the seventh chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning at the first verse. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they will trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which, what, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, 
For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree that bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognise them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who, bears these who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down streams rose and the wind blew against and beat against that house yet it did not fall because it had foundations on the rock but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand the rain came down the streams rose the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash when jesus had, when jesus had finished saying these things the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. On page 182, we join together in saying the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and autospotic church. I acknowledge of the baptism of the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's uh, sing again, number 418. Uh, Here, O Lord, I see thee face to face. Number 418.
as we come to your word, speak into our hearts and our lives, Lord, I pray, and give us ears to hear and lives and hearts that are ready to obey. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The way that we live and the choices that we make are important. And as such, the choices uh, that we have have consequences. There's a story of a man who's driving his car with his wife beside him. When he's stopped by the police, the officer said to him that he'd been clocked doing 80 miles per hour. The man responded that he had had the cruise control on at 60 miles per hour and that perhaps the officer's radar gun was wrong. His wife, not looking up from her knitting, said, Now, dear, don't be silly. You know that this car doesn't have cruise control. <laughs> the officer wrote a ticket. Uh, the, man's, the man looked at his wife and told her to be quiet. She says, you should be thankful that the radar detector it was off when it did, when you, when you were clocked. The officer wrote a second ticket for a legal radar detector device. At this point, the man shouts at his wife. The officer frowns and says, I notice, sir, that you're not wearing your seatbelt. That's an automatic fixed penalty of 60 pounds. Well, yes, officer, I had to take it off. I, I had it on, but I had to take it off when, when you pulled me over so that I could get my license out of my back pocket. His wife says, now, dear, you know very well that you didn't have your seatbelt on. You never wear your seatbelt when you're driving. The police officer is writing a third ticket and the man again shouts at his wife to be quiet. As the officer looks over and quietly asks, does your husband always talk to you in this way, madam? She responds, only when he's been drinking, officer. <laughs> what you see is appalling, an appalling attitude of a husband and this choice in the situation to lie. And both of those things have consequences for him. Jesus, as he continues the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 7 focuses on two things. Firstly, how we relate to one another and then applies all of the sermon to four illustrated applications that help us to see that there are two ways to live, in truth or in falsehood. And in each decision, we have consequences that will last right into eternity. Within that, the key verse in Matthew 7 is verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Jesus has been teaching uh, the far-reaching effects of the law in the way that we live our lives in this sermon. And this verse acts as that summary of the law in the same way uh, of love the Lord your God and love your neighbours yourself. It's about living with each other under the Lord, living out his word so that we do indeed care for one another, living in fellowship with one another as we live in obedience to the Lord and his word with one another. And so as we consider how this verse acts within the context of the rest of the chapter uh, and the implications of the law and applications of the law and the choices that we make, and the lives that we live, there are three points that we need to consider. Firstly, a right attitude between us, verses one to six. Judge not that you be not judged. This is a well-known and actually very much misused verse within scripture because its meaning is deeper than first appears. Jesus' emphasis in this section of the sermon is how the law affects uh, how we relate to one another. So how do we use this verse in our relationships? Well, for too long, many in the church have said, well, it means you cannot make judgments of each other, which in effect has been an excuse to tolerate all sorts of practices which are error. To get at what Jesus meant in saying judge not, we need to look at verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. In our faith, 
Jesus never asks us to disengage our brains. So in verse 6, he calls for us to, to make judgments on people and a judgment of people that is based on the fruit of their lives. Judge not has been used over the years, as I said, as, as an excuse for sin and to put up with error in the midst of church life. But that's far from Jesus' mind here because we're actually supposed to be spiritually discerning, which is the point of verse 6. So it's not a, a prohibition against making judgments. Well, what is it then? It is a reminder from Jesus that we ourselves are not perfect. Only God is perfect. But we have our faults and therefore we're not to be overly harsh in our judgments. That's not our place. There needs to be grace and humility. As John Stott puts it, generosity in our criticisms. Jesus helps us to understand what he's saying with the illustration of the speck and the plank where someone is criticizing someone else with a speck in their eye but ignoring the plank in their own eye. That's helpful because it highlights the truth that sometimes we're very good at seeing the faults in others while quite happily living with our own deficiencies. Or we're still knowing and indulging our own faults while criticizing others. We tolerate our own sin while condemning others for their sins. And so Jesus says, quite rightly, you hypocrites. So Jesus urges proper self-examination. We do this by allowing the scripture to shed us light into our lives so that we ourselves come under conviction and repent. But if you notice, what Jesus doesn't say here is, you've got a plank in your eye, so just leave the speck in your brother's eye. No, the speck shouldn't remain. It's no more acceptable than the plank. God's word needs to do its work in both their lives, helping each other in our walk together so that the word impacts our lives and we live therefore in faithfulness under God's word. That's the point of how we live together as brothers and sisters. So coming back to verse 6 therefore, for one, where verse 1 to 5 urges caution from being too harsh, Verse 6 warns us equally about being too lax. There's, no, there's, there's to be discernment among God's people so that the precious things of the gospel are protected and that our lives respond to and live out the gospel imperatives. So there should be a right attitude among God's people. Secondly, then, we see the point of a loving relationship. Verse 7 to 11. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and to the one who seeks finds. To the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or asks for a fish will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to, do, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him. We need to remember that Jesus at this point is bringing his Sermon on the Mount to a conclusion. A sermon in which he has set high standards for his followers. The question is, how do we attain these high standards? A big part of the answer lies in what Jesus says here. Because the answer is available to us always through prayer. He says in these words, ask, seek, and knock. In that, we see prayer to a loving Heavenly Father, which is effective. A prayer that is always answered. We have, we are truly enriched by and in our prayer life and in our relationship with our Lord and God in trust and in love. To help us see the truth of this, Jesus argues the case from the lesser to the greater. And so he takes us to, the, to an earthly father and demonstrates the love that a father has for his child. A father's love 
uh, should be a love that does its best, providing, satisfying real and genuine need. All we know from the news reports are that there are people whom we would class as evil, who do awful things to their children, who beat them, who abuse them, who neglect them. That's not a loving relationship. That's not the relationship that we're called to, either with one another or more importantly with the Lord. We recognize that such people are evil and therefore we dismiss them. Now we read what Jesus says, if then you who are evil know how to give, give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven good gifts, good, give good gifts to those who ask him? So we see in God's judgment that it's just not others who are evil. We are evil. He says this because all of mankind is sinful. Disobeying God's command. And so in our rebellion against a holy God, by our nature, we are evil. But even though we are evil, believer and non-believer alike, we know how to give good gifts to those whom we love. And the point follows through that God will do so much more to those who know him, who love him, who ask, who seek, who knock. God answers those who ask in prayer. And that leads us on to our last point, because Jesus turns in the second half of the chapter to deal with the fact that there are actually two ways to live. That there are true and false disciples. Verse 13 through 27. Verse 13, enter by the narrow gate. Verse 15, be aware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them is like the man who built his house on the rock. In each of these four illustrations, Jesus is nailing down the distinctives between genuine discipleship and the person who is in danger of damnation because they are false. And he sees a clear difference. Therefore, there are indeed two ways to live. There is no other option given by Jesus. Each of us has a choice to make about and what, therefore, will we choose. Firstly, enter the narrow gate as opposed to the broad gate. The point of what Jesus is saying here is simple enough. One is easy to find and the other takes searching and sifting. The easy road is the one many find and the gate which they go through. All they have to do is follow the crowd and in doing so, choose to ignore what Jesus is saying. This is indeed both easy and comforting, at least in the short term. Why? Because we're simply continuing continue to do what we like. But ultimately, as Jesus says, it is a road that leads to our destruction. However, no matter how many are seen to be choosing the broad gate, it's important to, to realize that there is a choice to make because there is a narrow gate. Because that's the choice we need to make. Because only there do we find life, eternal life. Living for now is something so easy to do because we simply indulge our passions and our desires because now is all that's important. That's the broad gate, the broad road. It is the hedonism of an unbelieving world. But what Jesus wants to say to us is that short-sighted and we need to recognize that there is more to life than now. Eternity lies before us. And the choices that we make between these two gates and these two roads 
have very different eternal destinations. Secondly, beware of false prophets. You will recognize them by their fruits. What Jesus is talking about here is the reality that has plagued the church from the earliest of days, beginning in, those er in that early church with Gnosticism and so many other heresies, leading right up to our own day to the liberalism and unbelief of a, of a church that denies God's word and God's truth. This is what makes falsehood so difficult to recognize because as Jesus helps us to see, outwardly they appear like sheep. But inwardly, they have a ferocious appetite of wolves, leading those astray, devouring them as the wolves that they truly are. It is an appetite that aims to divert people away from Jesus and into unhelpful beliefs and practices that run contrary to Scripture. However, what they are will be ultimately evident if we're paying attention, if we're being discerning, as Jesus encouraged us to be earlier. Because he says very clearly, by their fruit you will know them. Because they cannot produce fruit other than what they are by their nature. Therefore their lives will run out of sync with scripture. And for us today, a good indicator uh, are the church leaders and their people who feel it necessary to explain scripture away, to set it aside in favor of practices and beliefs that do indeed run contrary to that word. There is no confidence in salvation by faith. Rather, what you do is more significant. All these things add up to a person, a wolf that Jesus is talking about here. Beware of such leaders. They need to be avoided in the sense of following them because Jesus says their destination is ultimately going to be their judgment before the Lord. Thirdly then, Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. And this follows on from those who appear to be sheep but are not. Because the, the truth is, Many can run around churches and do all the right things, but their hearts are cold towards Jesus. How does that matter if people are in church singing and saying the right responses in the liturgy, doing what they think is right and good? How does it matter? Jesus says it matters because he doesn't know us and they don't know him. What matters is how we're living in relationship with him. Do we know Jesus' death and resurrection? Or are we ignoring it so that it has no power and effect in our lives because we haven't actually submitted to him in repentance and faith? So all the good that we think matters in our lives is of no consequence. If Jesus isn't part of our lives, the things of the church are nothing at all. Jesus has to be central. Our relationship with him ultimately is the only thing that matters. We need to give our lives to Jesus. If you haven't, you need to come before the cross and be transformed, be forgiven. If you don't, if we continue to ignore Jesus, then one day you too will hear these words. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Take time while you may to make a choice for Jesus. Believe in him and be saved. So fourthly and finally then, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them 
will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus' words are authoritative word, a word that needs to be heard and lived out in our lives. We can apply his word and build our house on a solid foundation of the rock, or we can ignore his word and do those things that we like in our lives, building on a foundation that is ultimately just sand, sand that washes away when trouble hits. The choice is ours. What will you do with the words that Jesus speaks here in the Sermon on the Mount? What will you do with what Jesus did for you? Hear the word of God. Hear the word of the Lord here. Don't allow the word of Jesus to wash over you. Don't allow Jesus' word to go on and to keep on going ignored in your life. Turn to him and believe. Trust in him and live in a relationship with him. There are two ways to live. Two choices to make. Either way, we have a harvest to reap in our lives. One to the kingdom and the other to destruction. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are Lord and you are God. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided for us most wonderfully in your Son, Jesus. Help us to hear him, to acknowledge him, to love and to serve him, that we may one day be with you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we continue in prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, who by the Holy Apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee, most merciful, to accept our alms and oblations and to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty. Beseech thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity and concord, and grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word <clears throat> and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also to save and defend all Christian kings, princes, and governors, and especially thy servant Charles our King, that under him we may be godly and quietly governed, and grant under his whole counsel, and to all who put an authority under him, that they may truly and impartially minister justice the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and clergy, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and living word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succour all them who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We also bless thy holy name for all thy servants to part of this life and thy faith and fear, beseech thee to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom, Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let's stand to sing our final hymn for this morning, number 636, 636, May the Mind of Christ my Saviour.
Let's close this part of our service by saying to word, together the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.